Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Dr. Laura Portales and I'm going to be uh, taking you through these videos for the course Managing People. And this video in particular is on Unit 1. So we will be doing an overview of some of the important concepts and the study guide as we work throughout this video. So let's go ahead and get started. Our course Managing People is structured into eight units. And in this video, we're going to be talking about individual behavior, which is unit one. And then in later videos, we'll be addressing motivation, business communication, managing human capital, leadership, managing groups and teams, create a winning organizational culture, and power politics and change. On this slide, we have the unit learning objectives. And learning objectives are really important because all of the content that you've learned in this unit are related back to these learning objectives. Also, also, the other thing that's really important is that learning objectives are ultimately tied to the practice exam that you'll be taking, as well as the final exam. As you go through, you just want to make sure once you finish a unit that you feel very confident that you've met all of these learning objectives, and that will help prepare you for the practice exam. Let's now take a look at the vocabulary that we will be addressing in this unit, unit one. We're going to look at the meaning of organizational commitment, job satisfaction, attitudes, values, and personality. We'll, looking, we'll also look at organizational citizenship behaviors, job performance, absenteeism, and turnover. We'll be talking about person job fit and person organizational fit. We'll discuss the POLC framework and a variety of decision-making models, including the rational model, the bounded rational model, intuitive decision-making model, and the creative decision-making model. We'll also talk about the difference between program decisions and non-program decisions. On this slide, we're gonna take a look at the, an overview of the topics that we'll be uh, discussing in unit one. So the first is attitudes and attributes, workplace behavior. We'll talk a bit about job satisfaction and what makes a job satisfying. We'll talk about person job fit, person organization fit, factors for job satisfaction, as well as decision making. Our first topic in this unit is attitudes and attributes. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we talked about and what you learned about in unit one. So the first thing that's important to recognize is uh, the impact of personality on workplace behavior. So personality are certain traits that explain or predict our behavior. And uh, we all have a personality and the personality traits that we have ultimately define us in a lot of ways about how we interact with people, how we interact at work, our levels of motivation, and so forth. So one of the things that contributes a lot to our personality is our values, and values are those things that are important to us. So for example, a value may be honesty, cleanliness, anything like that. So our values oftentimes impact our personality and our personality traits. Our attitudes, on the other hand, are our opinions about people, things, and situations. And of course, our values and our personality definitely affect our attitude about things. So when we look at that and we look at the idea of job satisfaction, um, job satisfaction is defined as uh, the feeling that people have toward their job. So of course, most of us strive to have a high job satisfaction. So we really like and have good feelings about our job. Um, a lot of times this can be determined by our personality, our values and our attitudes. Another thing that those things can impact is our organizational commitment. And our organizational commitment relates to the emotional attachment that we have toward our place of work. So as you can imagine, if our uh, values, for example, align really well with our organization's values, then we probably have a positive feeling about our organization. So the important thing to remember about these is that they're all intertwined and they all impact each other, especially when we think about managing people at, uh, at the places we work. One thing that's interesting to take a look at in terms of personality is the idea of nurture factors and nature factors. 
So nature factors are those things that are we're just born with. So there are some parts of our personality that we're just we just have. It's innate within us from the time we were very little. So that definitely impacts personality, but so does nurture factors. And these are the experiences that we have. So it could be past experiences, our relationship, family, family values, our upbringing, and all of these things. So those nature factors combine with the nurture factors ultimately um, to make us who we are in terms of our personality. Now that we've looked a bit at personality and the meaning of personality, we can then look at workplace behavior and we can begin to make some inferences about how our values and our personality ultimately impact our behavior when we're at work. So let's first look at job performance. Job performance refers to how well we do our job and our general mental ability to be able to be successful at the work that we do. Uh, there are a lot of things that can impact our job performance. For example, if we're really stressed or we have things going on at home that are challenging, of course our job performance may suffer a little bit. But overall job performance refers to how well we do our job with stress and other factors that can, uh, can impact our performance at work. We can also look at the concept of organizational citizenship behavior. And um, this is a type of behavior that would be considered positive in that people are motivated to help others. They want to do the right thing for the organization. They care about the people that they work with. And as you can imagine, our personality definitely impacts the level of organizational citizenship behaviors ultimately that we display. One of the impacts when people are not happy at work or their performance isn't what it should be is absenteeism and turnover. Absenteeism is essentially an unplanned absence. So it means that someone calls into work and, and they're not there. Um, whereas turnover is a little bit more extreme, turnover is when someone leaves an organization. So an important thing to remember from a managerial perspective is that absenteeism and for both, both cost companies an awful lot of money because it's then lost productivity. And in the case of turnover, it means that we have to find someone to replace the person that's left our organization. And that takes time and money away from other things that we could be doing. So it's in our best interest when we think about managing people to try to limit the amount of turnover and absenteeism that we see in our workplaces. Related to our last topic, there is a chart here that addresses the factors that we just discussed from job performance to citizenship, ab absenteeism, and turnover. And it's important to remember that uh, turnover sometimes happens due to poor performance on the part of the employee. It can be stress, a lot of, a, a lot of factors that occur there. Could just be that someone got a better opportunity. Absenteeism, uh, sometimes we see employees have health problems or um, they have challenges with work-life balance uh, or things that do cause them to, to miss days at work. And those would be unscheduled days, of course, or unscheduled absences, I should say. And then our citizenship often is impacted by how we're treated at work, our sense of fairness, whether we're being treated fairly, of course, our personality, and also um, our positivity toward work. And finally, job performance, as we discussed, uh, is dependent upon our mental capabilities and our mental abilities, stress level, and our attitudes about work. Next, we're going to look at job satisfaction. And there are many factors that determine whether or not someone is satisfied at work, but uh, these are the two that we're going to focus on for now. So the first is a person job fit. And this basically refers to the relationship of an individual's characteristics and the relationship of that to the jobs or the tasks that they're performing. So when we look at a good or a positive person job fit, usually people are more satisfied because their skills and abilities fit the job that they're actually doing. Now, uh, we'll talk a little bit about when a fit isn't good and how that can cause motivation issues a little bit later. 
Um, related to person job fit is the idea of demand abilities and demand abilities uh, includes things like employee knowledge and skills and abilities ultimately that match the job. When we talk about supply value fit as it relates to person job fit, this is when an employee's needs, desires, or preferences are met by their job, which of course is a positive thing. And um, when we look at job satisfaction as a whole, when someone doesn't have a fit for demand abilities, let's say they lack the skills to be successful at their job, clearly that isn't a very good person job fit. So as managers, we always want to make sure that we find the person job fit that is appropriate for not only the job, but for the individuals that we are working with. Now, when we look at person organization fit, we're looking at compatibility between individuals and the organization itself. So when we think about our values, the things that we find important, if we work for an organization that holds those same values, we're much more likely to be motivated working for that company. So we can look at a supplementary fit, and this occurs when someone possesses uh, attri attributes and abilities that are similar to others in the organization. And a complementary fit is when someone has attributes that are different than others in the organization and they fill a needed gap within the organization. So when we look at person organization fit, we want to have some supplementary fit, but we also want some complementary fit because we want some of those gaps of skills and gaps of knowledge to be filled within the positions we hire. Another important point to make about job satisfaction is that we have several generations working together uh, in the workforce more so than we ever have before. And as managers, we want to think about how each group, how each age group or generational group has been impacted by things like uh, economic events, political conditions, and a social upbringing. So because of this, because of these differences among the generations, uh, oftentimes we'll find that people have very different needs as far as what they expect or want out of it. So um, to motivate people, and we'll talk about this in a little bit in this unit, to motivate people, we wanna make sure that we're motivating them based on uh, the age and other demographic characteristics that we'll talk. So every generation has an idea of what job satisfaction is, and we want to, as managers, try to meet them wherever possible to provide that job satisfaction for them. One of the core concepts in this unit is the idea of the POLC framework. And this is a framework for managers that can help us better understand how managers um, ultimately need to do their jobs. So this stands for planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. And each of these functions of management are equally important to have a successful organization. So planning entails things like goal setting, making decisions, and ultimately looking toward the future and how we want the future to be and planning for that. Organizing looks at how we will actually achieve those goals that we set in the planning phase, how we're going to divide work, how resources are going to be divided in order to meet the goals that we've set forth. The leading element of the POLC, um, how, do you, how do you motivate people to try to reach those goals that you met? Uh, how do you um, entice them um, to skills and, and, and do their job well? And um, that's there are entire classes on the concept of leadership, but for our purposes for this class, just be aware that leadership is really the focus of how do you motivate someone and understand them enough so that you can motivate them in the way that they want to be motivated to do their job. Controlling is the last of the POLC framework, and it in, in involves reviewing processes. So you've planned, you've organized, now you're going to look at the plans that you've made and see if they're working or not. And if they're not, then you'll make adjustments to those plans or the way you're going about achieving them. Uh, and we call that corrective action. 
So the controlling phase is the last one, but then it can put us back into the, uh, the management framework cycle, back into planning as we see maybe things aren't working as well as we expected. So we plan and we make some new changes and then the cycle continues. So when you think about the POLC framework, it's just important to note that these are the main categories of duties that managers are responsible for. And just about every duty a manager does put in, in one of these areas, ultimately. One of the major aspects of the POLC framework is decision making and how we go about making good decisions as managers. And um, there are two main types of decisions that we'll need to make. The first is a program decision. And this is a decision that we make probably on a day-to-day -day basis. There are no major consequences if we make the wrong one. And think of them as everyday type decisions, such as uh, what you're going to work, uh, signing off on forms that you need to sign off on, these types of things. Non-program decisions are those types of decisions that tend to be more time consuming. They're non-routine and we really need to think a lot about those decisions before we make them because they could be costly decisions both in financial resources but also in time. So we want to make sure that we make the right decision. Within non-program decisions, we have a few models we can use to help us with decision making. And um, the first one is the rational decision making model. And we'll look at this on the next slide, but this lists formal steps to take when you're making a decision and can be really valuable if it is a decision that is really um, maybe is going to cost a lot of money or a lot of time. Our second type of non-program decision is the bounded uh, rational model. And this is where we look at thousands of possible choices and we kind of have an idea of what choices we want to go with. So really we only need to decide between maybe two or three choices. And in our study guide, the example given here was choosing a new cell phone. You probably have a particular carrier that you like and a particular brand that you like. So you're not really researching a hundred different cell phone models. You probably have it narrowed down to three because you sort of know what you want in terms of the, the choices and the branding. The intuitive decision-making model is one that managers use when they have extensive experience, training, and knowledge. And it's a specific process that a manager would go through in order to make a decision based on what they know and the experiences that they've had. The creative decision-making model is sometimes useful if we are trying to come up with a variety of new ideas, such as new products that we want to sell or uh, different pricing strategies and so forth. So the creative decision-making model generally requires a lot of uh, brainstorming and a lot of information gathered and a lot of that creative thinking in order to apply that model. So next, let's look a little bit closer at the rational decision-making model. The rational decision-making model is usually used for non-program decisions, and there are several steps in this model that you'll want to apply to make the model ultimately effective. So the first thing that you'll do when using this model is identify the problem. What is it that you're trying to solve with this decision that you're going to make? And then the second step is to establish your decision criteria. What is important to you? How are you going to go about actually making the decision? Are there some things that are more important than others that you need to focus on? So this is where you would ultimately establish that criteria, um, which will help you later on when you have all these choices and need to actually make the decision. Um, so the next will generate the alternatives. So you'll come up with all the possible alternatives uh, that ultimately solve, solves the problem. And then when we evaluate the alternatives, we're gonna go back to that decision criteria and the weighting of that decision criteria to apply some sort of way that we can, as they say, compare apples to apples. Uh, so looking at that decision criteria and each of the alternatives and comparing it would be part of this step. Next, you would then choose the best alternative 
And uh, after that, you'll implement the decision that you now a very, very important step that many managers forget is this last step, which is evaluating the decision. So at the end, you want to be able to say, oh, okay, that was a really good decision or, you know, we made that decision, but really we should have done this other decision or made changes to the way of our current decision. So whatever the case may be, we always want to go back and evaluate and make those small adjustments wherever possible so that we can make sure that it's the right decision. Another thing that we can look at with decision making is the level of decision. And we have three main levels of decisions. We have strategic decisions, tactical decisions, and operational decisions. Usually top management like CEOs make strategic decisions. Tactical decisions are those decisions that are focused around how we're actually going to go about doing something. And those are usually made by managers. And then operational decisions ultimately are focused on employees and how employees might go about organizing their work, how they should communicate and that type of thing. So now let's look at our conclusion and then we'll also talk about what's next. Let's take a final look at the topics that we discussed and how they relate to the learning objectives that we talked about at the beginning of this unit. We talked about individual attributes such as values, personality, and individual perspectives and how those impact the workplace. We also talked about the individual attributes and how those individual attributes affect work behavior. We talked about person job fit and person organizational fit and how those impact behaviors when people are at work. And then we also looked at decision making models in terms of the POLC model and some of the other methods like the rational decision making model. Let's take a look now at what's next. To prepare you for the practice exam, I definitely recommend that you do another review of the material, uh, maybe especially some of the material that you had some challenges with. Once you review that material, you should be all set to take the practice exam, and I wish you the best of luck.